number 44. No, no, number 19, I beg your pardon. <clears throat> number 19, Mitsugi Nishikawa, petitioner versus John Foster Dulles. Mr. Ware. May it please the court. <coughs> this case, as the preceding one and as the one to follow, uh, deals with a subsection of Section 401 of the Nationality Act of 1940, which involves a loss of citizenship. The subsection here is 401C, which provides the loss of United States citizenship by an American citizen who serves in a foreign army and who at the same time is a citizen of that foreign state. We have raised the constitutionality on its face of this subsection in our brief. And since the constitutional question has been uh, argued uh, substantially in the former case and will also be considered in the next case, I am not going to uh, discuss that uh, feature of this case. I'm going to address myself particularly to what Mr. Justice Frankfurter uh, in indicated with the due process features of this statute as applied to the petitioner. I'm going to assume the power of Congress to legislate in the field, A, of persons uh, serving in a foreign army abroad, B, where those persons have dual, nation dual nationality. I'm going to assume the, the naked or broad power, and I'm going to urge upon your honors that that power was not properly exercised so far as this case is concerned because it was exercised in a manner to <clears throat> be unreasonable and to offend due process. More particularly, to narrow my point and to narrow the problem, I'm going to be dealing with a question which Mr. Justice Harlan asked with respect to the matter of, in, of voluntariness and involuntariness. And I want to make at the very beginning uh, a distinction which to me seems to be cardinal uh, in connection with the use of the word voluntariness or involuntariness, because it can be used in two separate contexts and with two separate meanings. For instance, whether or not a person, when he does something, intends to lose his citizenship, or as one of the cases said, concurs in the loss of his citizenship by doing something, this is one example of voluntariness. For the purpose of my argument, I am going to assume that this is utterly inconsequential and that in that context he may lose his citizenship though, his con though it, he doesn't want to, though it is involuntary. But when Congress undertakes to specify various grounds for the loss of citizenship, which it did in this section 401 of which C is an, is an example, and it provides that merely doing that which Congress says it done results in loss of citizenship, it is clear and it is undisputed by the government that that act which Congress defines must be voluntary. For instance, if it's a question of service in the armed forces of another country, the government concedes there could be no loss of citizenship if the service was involuntary, if the service in the armed forces. So in that respect, and in this narrow fashion, uh, voluntariness is important, it is conceded, and it is the heart of the petitioner's case so far as this case, this case is concerned. Because we say that in the trial below under section 503, the trial court, in ultimately ruling that the petitioner voluntarily served in the armed forces of Japan, uh, ignored and violated the rules laid down by this court as to the quantum and burden and nature of proof which is upon the government, where the stakes are deprivation, forfeiture of this most precious of rights, the rights of citizenship, that the court below uh, lay down an incorrect rule of law as to where the burden of proof was. It followed an incorrect rule of law so far as any presumption that might follow upon a showing that the petitioner, the petitioner served in a foreign army as a result of conscription and that in any event, uh, the courts below uh, rule against the petitioner 
without complying with the standards imposed by this court in connection both with uh, persons who were citizens by naturalization or by birth, namely that the evidence against the petitioner and in favor of the government is not clear and convincing and unequivocal uh, to warrant the forfeiture of this precious right. Now, fortunately, we have here a record of some 40 pages, not the uh, 15,000 page record which Your Honor's wrestled with in, uh, in, uh, in Yates versus the United States, and the record is before Your Honors, and in a moment I want to refer to it. I mean, the record of the trial is comparatively brief, it is some, some 40 pages in that. Uh, first, with respect to a couple of propositions of law, and then I want to deal with these propositions of law as reflected by the facts in this case. We say that where the government says that an American has lost his citizenship by virtue of doing something which, so far as the citizen is concerned, is not accompanied by any knowledge on his part that he is forfeiting or abandoning or affecting his citizenship, that as a minimum, the burden of proof that the petitioner has committed the act proscribed or set forth in the statute voluntarily, that that burden is upon the government. Now, additionally, we say... That's sort of an exception to the rule as it would be in ordinary cases, other types of cases? No. We say it is not exception to the rule in other types of cases at all analogous. We say it is the rule because we say that this court has defined expatriation as the voluntary renunciation or abandonment of United States citizenship. This is the phrase that Chief Justice Hughes used in Curtis versus L. We say that the act of expatriation, that's what's involved here, losing your, 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 your citizenship, is an act which must be voluntary in order for it to consist of an act of expatriation. And if the government says that I, or you, anyone here, has lost his citizenship and has expatriated himself, it must prove that the act which the citizen committed was voluntary and not involuntary. I think, in other words, we say one of the elements, one of the inherent and indispensable elements of expatriation is voluntary. The burden of proof of which is upon the government, the same as it has the burden of proving that uh, that uh, uh, the person did, did something which the act proscribes. So we, uh, we do not say we're asking for an exception. We're simply saying that uh, uh, this is part of the definition of voluntariness, uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, is inherent in the definition. But in any event, even if we're mistaken about that, there is a serious question in this case with respect to the presumption which a court should draw, we say must draw, where, uh, in a case like ours, the, it's just the evidence is the petitioner is a citizen of the United States, born in the United States. The evidence is that he served in a foreign army, but that he served solely by virtue of conscription. That is, he received an order from a foreign army to, to appear for induction. We say, we think all of the circuits, with the exception of the circuit below in this case, uh, take the view that upon that showing, there has been a showing by the petitioner of involuntariness and that the burden then shifts to the government to, to rebut the presumption of involuntariness which uh, that showing uh, uh, makes. And this was the showing here. But then we say finally, though of course I'm not through with my argument, our, our central point is that irrespective of where the burden of proof is, assuming now I'm entirely in error in Assuming I'm merging upon your honors, which I believe I am not, an exception, and that we're wrong about it, and that uh, uh, the burden is upon the petitioner in a general way to carry his burden of his case. We say that all of the evidence, some 40 pages, if looked at by the court, will bring this court, as a minimum, to have a troubling doubt as to whether there was sufficient evidence to uh, justify the forfeiture of, si of, of citizenship. And in Baumgartner and other cases, your honors have reviewed 
judgments, both by trial and appellate courts, findings against the citizen, Baumgartner, uh, naturalized citizen, in Gonzales, the last nationality case I argued before your honors, which you decided per curiam, uh, one born in the United States, uh, you've taken the view, and in, in Gonzales you cited Baumgartner, that if your honors look at a case, even though it comes here and cased in the armor of findings by, by, by lower tribunals, <coughs> both of them, and you have a troubling doubt as to whether there should have been a forfeiture, you will reverse the judgment. Let me go on to what the facts are in this case. As I've said, uh, one, this boy was born in the United States and was an American citizen by virtue thereof. He was also a dual citizen. By virtue of no conduct on his part, by virtue of nothing that he did, he was a dual citizen because the government of Japan prior to the war said by its laws that every person born in the United States of Japanese ancestry was a citizen of that country. He was a dual citizen because he was a dual citizen without his knowledge or consent, because his father, in accordance with the practice of thousands of Issei in the United States, before he was 14 days of age, went down and registered, registered his name in the Koseki or in the, or in the Japanese family register. He got his education in the United States. He's a graduate of the University of California. He went to Japan in 1939. He had no ties in Japan. He went to Japan as thousands of Nisi went to Japan at the request of their parents, their passage paid by their parents, to secure some education and to have a visit. He went there for the purpose of staying two to five years, temporarily, and his passport application and his passport shows it. He went there as an American citizen and only as an American citizen. He at no time, either here or in Japan, ever asserted any right as a Japanese citizen or claimed any privilege or desired any benefit because he was a Japanese citizen. It is urged by the government that when he went to Japan in 1939, he knew that he was a Japanese citizen. The record does not support that. The record is to the effect that when he was in Japan, he discovered that he was a dual citizen solely because his name was on the, reg on the family register. He went to Japan in 1939. He was then under no obligation to render any military service in the United States. The United States conscription law hadn't been passed. He couldn't have known that he was endangering his citizenship when he went to, the United when he went to Japan or when he was conscripted in the Japanese army because the Nationality Act, which provides for his loss of citizenship, wasn't even adopted at the time he went to, he went to Japan. He was being supported by his father. And one thing he couldn't foresee is that his father would die three months after he was in Japan to leave him penniless. And in 1940, he received a notice from the Japanese army to appear for a physical examination. And in March 41, he was ordered inducted. <coughs> now we say this was involuntary, just as involuntary as this court has often said when a person received a subpoena and he appears as a witness, he isn't appearing voluntarily. He is appearing under coercion. And the decisions have been uniform in recent years that where service in a foreign army is under coercion, it is not the kind of voluntary conduct which is indispensable to warrant a forfeiture of citizenship. Mr. Justice Holland, let me make one further explanation. The argument that a citizen's rights can be taken away from him completely involuntarily Namely, that if he serves in a foreign army and he is conscripted in a foreign army and is coerced by physical violence in a foreign army, that nonetheless he loses his citizenship and that 401 CISO provides is the very argument the government made some years ago in a case known as Doss Reese versus Nichols, which we cite. And the court, court of appeal there rejected the argument that it is either constitutional or, or, or believable that Congress, no matter its authority to over foreign relations, and no matter its legitimate concern to prevent conflicts between this country and another, that Congress could go to that extent, 
the court in Doss Reese versus Nichols didn't say it. Uh, what I'm going to say now, a justice of this court did. Uh, the point is that this would be offensive to common decency and, and, and elementary fair play. So that we say up to this point, the evidence of involuntariness was reasonably persuasive. We say that it became conclusive as a result of further testimony. This boy testified, well, let me perhaps withdraw that and, and, and uh, develop the argument this way. The trial court found against the plaintiff, against the petitioner. And he did so, we think, as a result of a, of a misapprehension as to the duties of a citizen living abroad and a, a misapprehension as to the applicable rules in this kind of a case. The trial judge was of the view that this petitioner lost his citizenship, although there's no question he was conscripted into the Japanese army, because the petitioner refrained from doing certain things which, he th which the judge thought a citizen should do. In the first place, the trial judge was of the view that the petitioner should have returned to the United States instead of staying in Japan. We think this is utterly unrealistic and quite unfair. In the first place, we were then not at war with Japan. We didn't even have a conscription law. The United States government has recognized dual citizenship, as Mr. Justice Frankfurter said a few, few moments ago. There he was in Japan, and he got a notice to serve in the Japanese army. At that time, it was such service was not inconsistent with any allegiance he had to the United States. And certainly he cannot be charged with the lack of prescience to foretell that a couple of years afterwards there would be a war between the United States and Japan. He made no effort to return to this country, but he explained the reason he did it is because he was penniless, funds from his father had stopped, he went to work, and he was earning 70 yen a month, $15 a month and he didn't have the fare to get home, so he stayed on. And of course, if he attempted to leave after he got a notice to appear for physical examination, well, certainly the same thing would have happened to him that happens to uh, uh, Americans who try to leave to, to evade, evade the draft. The trial judge held it against him that he didn't do one other thing, didn't do three other things, that he didn't go down to the United States consulate and assert his rights there. And there are two answers to this claim. One is that he, as he testified, had a friend who worked in the embassy and the United States embassy, according to this friend, could do nothing for persons who were in Japan. Some intimation, some claim is made by the judge and some intimation appears in the government's brief that had he got, gone down to the United States consul, the consul could have granted him some relief. The fact of the matter is, as we point out in our brief, that the State Department had formally announced that it would not help any persons in Japan who were being drafted in the Japanese army. Furthermore, he testified that he didn't protest to the Japanese authorities because he was afraid that he was afraid not only of the penal sanctions which accompany this, the, 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 the uh, conscription law of Japan, but he was afraid of extra penal sanctions by the Kempetai, the Japanese military police. That uh, he knew that the boarding house where he was living had been visited by the Japanese military police. And that he had heard rumors, he didn't know whether they were true or not, <coughs> that persons who attempted to <coughs> evade the uh, Japanese military system. This is 1940. This is while Japan is under control, as we, we, which is a matter of common knowledge of a of a of a, of a ruthless military caste. That he uh, had heard that the Kempetai had pursued some persons who were evading the draft, and in uh, one instance they suspected that a person was hiding in a, a trunk filled with straw and they bayoneted the trunk and killed the person who was in it. Now, he didn't see this, but he was afraid of it. And we have submitted to the clerk of this court uh, documents, official reports of the United States government through SCAP, Supreme Command of Allied Headquarters, General MacArthur's headquarters, with respect to the conduct of the Kempe Tai so far as the Japanese people generally were concerned, and particularly the Nisei 
who were who were living in in Japan. Now the judge went further. The judge said that when this boy went to Japan, went to Japan, he went there for the purpose of doing his hitch in the Japanese army. There isn't the slightest evidence to warrant any such finding or any such opinion. The difficulty as I view it, with the judge below, if I may be both facetious and, and serious at the same time, is that he gave too much credit to the University of California. This boy had graduated from the University of California. And because he was a graduate from the University of California mm -hmm. and went to Japan when, when he was 23, this judge said this boy is a bright man. He said he is a graduate of one of our greatest institutions of learning in this country. And so he proceeded to accord to this petitioner a knowledge of political affairs, a wisdom pertaining to them, and a prescience of possible conflict between the United States and Japan, as a result of which uh, he felt this boy knew more than, he, than, uh, than, than met the eye, and therefore he arrived at the conclusion that he must have known many things which, uh, which uh, were not clear, and uh, therefore he lost his citizenship. Mr. Wearing, yes, suppose sir. that there were extirpated, suppose they were cut out from this record, the testimony of the petitioner. Yes. Uh, what would there be left in the record? If that testimony were cut out, there would be nothing in the record because the only testimony comes from the lips of the petitioner. If the trial judge disbelieved the petitioner, then there is nothing in the record to warrant a forfeiture of citizenship because then there is nothing in the record that the petitioner has acted voluntarily and the government hasn't carried any, of the, any burden, uh, not even the most minimum burden, which this court has said it must carry in order for a loss of citizenship. What was there, what is the residuum of the testimony of the petitioner on the basis of a cross-examination? Uh, while he may disbelieve the petitioner, while the trial judge may disbelieve a petitioner when he gives exculpatory or favorable to testimony or negative testimony, the case may be made out against him on cross-examination. Yes. Well, in a, extent, is that true in, in this case? In a brief word, I think all of the cross-examination elicited was one, was some of the things I have recounted, that he was a graduate of the university. Two, that he knew that Japan was engaged in war in Manchuria. He denied that he knew that he was subject to conscription, and the judge, judge doesn't, uh, uh, the judge, however, makes a finding that he did know that he was subject to conscription in, in Japan. The further import of the cross-examination would be to the effect that uh, he communicated with his family and with friends in the United States from which and he was asked whether or not he didn't know that there was a draft in the United States. This was after 40. He said, no, they didn't tell him that. Now, I, I, I can't see much more. I'm sure the, the Solicitor <coughs> General or Assistant <coughs> General will see much more in the cross-examination, will answer Your Honor's question better than I. Mr. Davis. Mr. Chief Justice. May it please the court. Like Mr. Warren, I intend to devote myself, uh, unless the court desires to hear argument on the question of constitutionality, solely to the issue of the burden of proof of duress and the quantum of proof of duress. What is sufficient proof of duress in a case uh, such as Nishikawa's? And this not, not what the record shows. Uh, yes. Not abstractly. No, no, on, in the basis of the facts in this particular case. Right. Uh, the, issue, the, the general issue of who has the burden of proof and the general issue of what is the quantum of burden of proof is important not only in this particular case, but it arises very frequently in expatriation cases, both under the 1940 Act and under the later Act of 1952. So it is a general problem which is troubling uh, the courts uh, in this field. Uh, if I may state summarily first what the government's position is and then try to elaborate it, 
I think it may be helpful. And I would like to stress at the outset that when I state what the government's position is, I am basing that position on three sources. One source, a very important source, is the legislative history of the 1940 Act, which we believe bears out our view of the burden of proof, where the burden of proof is, and the quantum of proof. The second source is prior decisions of this court in the particular field of expatriation. And the third source is analogous and comparable provisions in other fields of law. The statute itself shed no light. The statute itself, except the words of the statute shed no light. The word voluntarily does not appear in the statute. Uh, the light is shed by the legislative history and by the, by the decisions of this court and the lower courts. Uh, summarily, what our position is is this. The citizen claimant has the burden of proving that the uh, act of expatriation which he committed, an act which the government must prove, but he has the burden of proving that that act of expatriation was done involuntarily in order to excuse himself from the effects of that act. That's the first proposition. You say that's the uh, burden of the uh, uh, person being uh, expatriated? Yes, the citizen claimant, I call him. Uh, the second... Let's see if I understand that. You say that if the government proved the external fact... That he joined the foreign army. The external fact. That's right. And uh, the uh, claimant says we, we, can't, uh, we put in no proof. That, that the government... That can go against it. That's right. Uh, I would say this, that in certain acts of expatriation, there is a subjective element yes, such I'm as... Talking about but, talking that's about. right. Uh, the second proposition is that the citizen claimant, petitioner here in Nishikawa, does not fulfill his burden of proof by proving that he was conscripted. That is, that is not sufficient. That if all he proves is that he was conscripted, that is not sufficient. The case goes against him and in favor of the government. My third proposition is, in relation to this particular case, that all that Nishikawa has proved as the case comes to this court after a trial before a district court and findings by the district court affirmed by the Court of Appeal, but as the case comes before this court, all that Nishikawa has proved is that he was drafted into the Japanese army in 1941. And if I am right on the first two propositions, he cannot make a case by proving that he was conscripted. Uh, I would stress now, before I go in, in, when I go into the, uh, th there's a fourth proposition which we also stand on and which I probably won't have much time to go into, but which is uh, expressed in our brief. That in this particular case, regardless of where the burden of proof is and regardless of what the quantum of proof is, the trial judge found, irrespective of the burden of proof, that Nishikawa's entry into the Japanese armed forces was voluntary. So that in this particular case, if the court wished, we believe that it could pretermit the issues of burden of proof. It could find that even if the government had the burden of proof, that burden of proof was satisfied. Uh, I wonder if you're referring to the fact that uh, the there was still sufficient evidence to convict him of the Yes, Mr. Justice. Uh, our position is that even if uh, whatever, whoever has the burden of proof, if you just look at Nishikawa's own testimony, which is all that there is in this case, it is sufficient to find that his entry into the, into the Japanese armed forces was voluntary. Let me go, if I can, to the, <coughs> the facts in this, in this particular case. But before I do, I would like to stress the fact, because I think that Mr. Warren did not emphasize it for reasons which are clear from his point of view, that the trial judge did not believe Nishikawa's testimony that he was frightened. He did not believe his testimony that he stayed, that he refused to do anything to keep himself out of the Japanese army because he was afraid of the secret police or afraid of anything else. Now, this was a man who appeared before the trial judge. He was a witness on the stand, and the trial judge said explicitly, I do not believe his claim that he didn't, that, uh, of, of uh, terror. Uh, and whatever may be the power of a court, of appellate court, to review findings of fact by a trial judge in an expatriation case, certainly the, the credibility of the witness is still within the, in the hands of the district court. The, this court said that in a naturalization case, the Naur case, 
they said that credibility still remains with the district judge. And so, if I may, I would like to state the facts in this case in that light. Uh, the facts, most of which I shall state first, are undisputed. It was that he, uh, he was born in the United States in California, went to the public schools here, went to the University of California, got a, an engineering degree, uh, and graduated. In 1939, in August 1939, he went abroad uh, to Japan at the instance of his father, paid for by his father for the purpose of studying in Japan for a period of two to five years. He did not know Japanese written characters. He apparently knew Japanese as a spoken language. He did not know written Japanese. When he got over there, he hired a tutor for the purpose of studying written Japanese. Shortly after he got over there, he apparently got there, we'll say, in August 1939. In November 1939, his father died, and his testimony was that he then was cut off from, from income from the United States, and he had to take a job, which he did. He took a job in an airplane plant, which he kept until he was inducted into the Japanese Army. Now, the district judge also made a very specific finding of fact in his findings of fact that when Nishikawa left the United States in August 1939 to go to Japan, he knew that Japan was at war or had hostilities in Manchuria and that he knew he was liable to be drafted into the Japanese army, that he knew he was a Japanese citizen as well as an American citizen, that he had dual nationality, as Mr. Waring said. Well, what, <coughs> what evidence did he base that finding on? He based it on Nishikawa's own statement that he knew he had Japanese citizen, citizenship. Now, that statement, uh, in the colloquy in the, in the record, it, uh, the, the examination is this. When you went into the Japanese army, did you know you were an, uh, Jap an American? Well, I a Japanese you to say when he left the yes, country. Yes, that's let's, right. Let's take it right from there. Well, that's I right. I, 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 that point on, what, what evidence the judge used to support that finding? Well, presumably the judge Knew, used the fact that this was an intelligent man, that he went to, that he went to Japan for some reason, that he that he t testified that he knew he had Japanese citizenship uh, when he got went into the Japanese army. It's when he went into the Japanese, it isn't qualified to say that I didn't know it before. The question was when he went into the when you went into the Japanese army, did you know that you had Japanese citizenship? The answer yes. I knew I had been registered. Now that doesn't exclude the fact that he knew it before he went into. Well, is there evidence to show that he did know it when he left this country, as you said? I think that the evidence is what I've said, Mr. Justice, that a trial court can properly and did properly base that finding on, on the knowledge of the man's intelligence, the fact that he went to Japan, uh, which people don't ordinarily do unless uh, uh, to study Japanese uh, language and literature, unless they have some connection with Japan, that he knew that Japan was fighting in Manchuria, and that he knew uh, that he was, a, by the time he went into the Japanese army, he knew he was a Japanese citizen. I think that's sufficient finding that he knew when he went abroad that he was a Japanese citizen, uh, a dual national. Uh, that is, and that is the trial judge's finding. Now, in June of 1940, which is a little less than a year after he got to Japan, he was notified that what he... Was the, what was the evidence to the effect that, that he knew he was a Japanese citizen at the time he went into the army? No, I don't, I don't question it there, but I mean, just what is the character of the evidence that the judge used to relate it back to 1939? It's a general question, uh, which perhaps unfortunately the U.S. attorney prefaced by saying, when you went into the Japanese army, but the answer is a general answer. It's on page 34 of the record, at the bottom of the record. We'll take the question, too. Now at the time that you entered the Japanese army, Mr. Nishikawa, you were a national of Japan, is that correct? Answer, yes. I was a national of Japan because my father registered at the time of my birth in the family register. Uh, that's, and, that's and that plus the other elements, plus his going to Japan, uh, his intelligence, uh, all these other things, uh, was the foundation for the judge's finding that he knew when he went to Japan uh, that he was a Japanese national and subject to the draft. Uh, now, in June 1940, the same evidence, plus the fact that it was common knowledge that Japan was engaged in hostilities in Manchuria and that Japan, like many other nations of the world, had conscription. Uh, I think the judge was entitled to and did take into account uh, that common knowledge, which he would assume that uh, a Nisei uh, who went to Japan would know about. But 
There's also evidence that he made no attempt to check whether he was subject to, to, to uh, the draft or not. And that also entered into the court's finding. Was he asked that he did? He was, he yes, he asked and he denied it. But again, that's an issue of credibility. The judge said, I do not believe him. Uh, well, you might not believe him, but still not have enough evidence to show what he was. Yes. He did know. But we but think that... not believe this thing, so <coughs> we, we think taking everything into account, what I've said, plus the demeanor of the witness and so forth, there was sufficient evidence. There would be sufficient evidence for a jury to find beyond a reasonable doubt that he knew uh, of this fact when he went to Japan. Now, in June 1940, he had a physical examination, uh, which he took. He was not inducted into the Army until nine months later, in March 1941. Now, there's a period of nine months. Now, during that period of nine months, there is no doubt, because he admitted it, that he did not take any of the following steps. He did not find out from any American official at the consulate uh, what to do, whether he was subject to the draft or was there anything he could do. He did not ask any Japanese official uh, whether he was subject to the draft or whether he could get out of it because he was an American official. Uh, he did not seek to renounce his Japanese nationality, which others had done. Perhaps it was a difficult thing, but he did not seek to, to do it or to find out whether he could have done it. He did not seek to find out whether he could return to the United States, whether he would be given money by the Americans or, or some other way. Uh, I'm not saying... This, this is, when was it? Be today, but he didn't between June 1940 and March 1941. He was inducted in March yes. 1941. So now, how much of an inference against it did he draw that during that period he didn't take the affirmative step to say, I want to renounce any responsibility on the Japanese uh, law uh, because I'm an American? Do you think that's a, that's a fair yes, Mr. inference Justice. of actuality of asking that yes. in Japan during those months? Yes. I think right. if you will take the great mass of cases, you will find, and we have tried to set out in our supplemental brief all the appellate cases on this subject, you will find out that some efforts are made. Uh, and, and as I'll try to get to later, Congress expected some efforts would be made. They might not be successful. I'm asking. I just, uh, yeah. I just try to place myself in that situation. Uh, and maybe I'm making a wrong attribution of what the feeling in Japan at the time was. Others made the, made the yeah. attempt. Uh, I, I should say right now, because the, uh, the other side's latest brief seems to think that we take the position that the man had to, shall I say, scream from the housetops. No. Scream the American flag. That's right. Uh, uh, the whole proposition which is that Congress said you've got to show some resistance to going into the Japanese army. You, in order to <coughs> show uh, lack of duress, you've got to show that you tried to keep out in some way. We don't expect you to be a hero or a martyr. But we have to show, we have to see something which indicates that you, uh, you didn't want to go in. At this point, it's perhaps a good place for me to ask you what I'd like to know, whether we can take any, to take judicial notice on the basis of experience that the department has had, or otherwise, of what were the conditions, the run of conditions in Japan in compelling people to enter the Japanese army. Uh, people of Japanese stock. I think uh, I have difficulty with the problem of judicial notice because uh, a, a large opportunity was granted to experienced counsel, Mr. Warren is probably the most experienced counsel in this field, in his firm, uh, to present evidence in the district court which could have been qualified by the government or controverted. This was not done. It has been done in other cases. It was not done here. I well, think it is... I should think that which appeared in other cases might almost Well, uh, we think not because I respect your we respect think not because in right. each in each case the government may have uh, we had no opportunity to bring other things in here, uh, which we didn't do. And what was brought in other cases <coughs> he's brought a conglomeration of other cases, not. And well, we had. Are you saying that I must rid my mind of any notion that on the whole the Japanese uh, made it almost impossible for a lad in this situation not to have no, Mr. Justice. I think you can assume that the Japanese ordinarily force people... In. Yes, but I do not think you can assume that other people, other dual nationals in his situation, did not make efforts to get out or to stay away or to get protection or to come back to the United States or to renounce their Japanese nationality. That I think you cannot assume on the basis of judicial notice. Now, may I ask this question, <coughs> Mr. Davis? Uh, uh, suppose he had gone to the American consulate after he received notice to uh, 
to go into the Japanese army or to come for for uh, physical examination. So, would he have had any right under international law to, through our consul, to be sent home? Uh, probably not, uh, Mr. Chief Justice. But the point that Congress was interested in, the point that Congress was interested in, is seeing whether he made the effort. It might be that he would have to go into the. You mean in do a futile thing. Yes. Because they, they were trying, they, they were trying to take his citizenship away from him because he didn't do a feudal thing. They were trying to separate uh, the sheep from the goats. They were trying to separate those who <coughs> really made the effort, uh, made what effort they could in the particular circumstances, uh, and uh, from those who who didn't, who didn't indicate an attachment to the United States. Are you saying that they wanted some show of good faith? Yes. That, that, and if I, perhaps... Well, well, if there is no, if there is no legal right for him to go home, if it would have been dishonored, and if he would have put himself in, in difficulties with the Japanese regime, uh, does the government expect him, at the expense of his, uh, his safety, to go to the American consul and ask them to see that he goes home when the government knows that it can do nothing for him? Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, I don't accept the last statement you made, that it would put him in difficulty. Other people did. Uh, or, and and so nobody I, had any difficulties? Well, I can't say they did. Uh, I, I don't know, but other people did. Uh, there are, and other people did leave before they were... Did, he say, did he say anything that... Uh, did he make the kind of assertion that you were hypothetically saying he could have made? No, he did not. He said he did not. He excused it. I don't mean to say, did he do these things, but did he explain at the trial why he didn't do anything? Well, he said he was afraid that the Japanese police would uh, get after him, and the judge disbelieved those, those statements. Well, I, uh, I thought he said also that he was working out in the country a good many miles from the, the city, that he didn't uh, read any Japanese papers because he didn't uh, he didn't understand the, the characters, and that uh, for that reason he didn't know. Oh yes, but he didn't say that. The only reason he gave for not trying to find out about whether he was going to be drafted or not drafted, or for going to the American consulate, was the fact that he was afraid that there were rumors. He said which might have been true. He was never himself personally contacted by any Japanese police officer. He said that. He was never, he never personally came in contact with any uh, Japanese police officer. He had no personal uh, experience which would have led him to believe that anything bad would have, would have happened to him. Did the government offer any evidence to show that those rumors were not true? No, Mr. Uh, Justice, I don't think it had to, uh, because on the basis of, of his own testimony and the way he put it, and the demeanor evidence which the judge had, the judge was uh, could disbelieve these statements. And he also said that he told a friend of his who worked at the American Embassy of him, and that this friend at the American Embassy told him that the country would do nothing for him. Yes, he said that he talked... Did he offer any evidence to show that was false? No, no evidence was offered by the government. That, that, that was conversation, true, wasn't it? That pardon? was the truth. They couldn't do anything for him. Well, there, there were things... They couldn't keep him out of the Japanese army, but there were yeah. things that could have been done. People did return to this country. Uh, After they were summoned into the Japanese yes, army? Yes, between the time of summonsing and the time of induction. Perhaps it was illegal under, ja under Japanese law, I don't know, but it was done. Uh, and, uh, uh, so that, and even before, he was, after all, he, did, he, he, didn't, he only received the notice of, excuse me. records of those things, they did do something for these Japanese who were there, called a No, the records are not in this, in this case. Are there any records that we can find that show that? Uh, in view of your question, uh, Mr. Justice, I feel uh, justified in calling account of the material which the Petitioner's Council has filed in this court. This was not introduced at the trial court. It was material from other cases which was introduced in the Court of Appeals and which has been filed in this court. We do not think it is properly part of the, of the record. But I did go over it, and, and in one of the depositions in, in, in the cases filed by M Mr. Weirin in here, uh, in another case, in another case, uh, the question, uh, you knew prior to the war for about a year that the consulate was advising all American citizens to leave Japan, didn't you? Yes, I did. Isn't it true that there were in addition, 
that there were, in addition to official statements by the State Department, that among the Japanese people in this day there were rumors and general talk about the fact that American <coughs> citizens should leave Japan. Yes. Uh, uh, he was uh, ordered for uh, examination more than a year, wasn't he? Yes, it was. More than a year before we got June into the war. Well, that wouldn't conflict. <laughs> It wouldn't necessarily conflict, no. but he, he wasn't uh, uh, inducted until March 1941. No, but he was ordered, ordered up before that, a year before we... He was given a physical examination. Yeah. I don't know whether that... I don't know, and the record doesn't show whether that's ordering up. And the, he and violated the law of Japan by leaving at the I don't know. The only law of Japan that appears in the record doesn't say. It says anybody who doesn't come into the barracks when ordered. Uh, it violates the law of Japan. Suppose a man leaves, uh, leaves this country well, after he's ordered up for examination. In, under our law, it is an offense. Jail, it? it is. I, I, in our view, yes. <laughs> uh, if I may, I would like to, because we think it's very important, point out, uh, one, uh, that this court, we believe, has already held in 1953 in the Okamura and Morata cases in 342 United States that conscription alone is not sufficient because there the court sent it back though there was undisputed proof of conscription of two Japanese who entered the Japanese army. There was undisputed proof. The court sent it back for findings and investigation as to the other elements. So all the circumstances of the case, I think the court said. And if I can, I'd like to get to the legislative history because we haven't set it out. Yes, the Murata and Okamura case, 340. It's Atchison against Murata and Atchison against Okamura per curiam decisions of the court. Uh, the legislative history is stronger than we set it out in our brief, uh, as I had occasion to find out when I was preparing uh, for our argument. The reason it is stronger is that there are, there, are, there are proof, we believe, of two factors. One factor is that, that the Congress did not believe that conscription alone would be enough proof of duress. And the second factor is that Congress thought that the burden of proof of duress should be on the uh, citizen claimant. Those two uh, elements of our, of our case. Now, what about conscription? You say that's not in your brief? Uh, the particular citations are not in the brief. The, there's a general reference to what the legislative history. Pardon me? Can you give me the citations? Uh, they're in the brief at page 30. Oh, I, th oh, I thought you said they were not in the brief. The quotations <laughs> that I'm about to give the court are not Pardon. in the brief. The quotations are somewhat striking. The pages are given in, in the court, in the brief. Uh, now, when this particular provision of the statute was before uh, the committee and the representatives of the various departments were there, and I should say that in the legislative history of the 1940 Act, one very important element of, fa uh, one very important source of legislative history are the hearings, because the, the bill had been drafted by the cabinet committee of which the Solicitor General spoke in the last case. And the representatives of the State Department, the Labor Department, and the Justice Department were right there in with the Committee on Immigration and Naturalization. And when the bill did get to the houses of Congress, there are constant references to the help of the, of the officials of the three departments. Uh, and so it's fair to go back to the hearings to see what occurred there as part of the important legislative history of the Act. Uh, now, when this particular provision of joining a foreign army came before uh, the committee, the State Department, through its representative, Mr. Flournoy, the assistant legal advisor, wanted to make it conclusive uh, of, that a man who joined the foreign army, of which he was also a citizen, uh, couldn't show duress at all. And he said, they're always trying to show duress, he said, and they're always trying to show it. We ought to make it conclusive that if he joins the army of another country of which he is a citizen, uh, he is automatically expatriated, whether he did it voluntarily or involuntarily. And the War Department supported that position. Now, the Labor Department and the Justice Department opposed it. And the grounds of their opposition are very important to my argument, because their grounds were, we ought to let him have an opportunity to come in and show that though he was drafted or though he entered the Army, he did what he could to stay out. They put it always in terms of, give him the opportunity to show. I think he ought to have the chance to show which is as clear an indication of where the burden of proof could lie in the terms uh, in which Congress uh, was considering it as there could be. The Labor Department and the, and the Justice Department succeeded in their view. Congress did not adopt the, the uh, view of Mr. Flournoy. But we think you must take 
together with that action of Congress, the legislative background, which is he ought to have the opportunity to show, he ought to be, have a chance to show, the burden is on him. That would be invalid, Mr. Uh, Justice, under the provisions of the Constitution. But this is not a criminal offense. This is an entirely different kind of <coughs> statute. And, and the... It raises a question, however, does it not, that a man's citizenship be taken away from him, but the extent Congress could go, holding it could be taken away without proof. Yes, it, it may raise a question, but we think that in the light of the previous decisions of this court, which are cited in our brief, there is no constitutional objection to what doing what Congress did. Mr. Davis, I don't know that I fully follow this. Are you giving us uh, arguments dealing with burden of proof which go to the interpretation of subsection C or what? Yes, it goes to the interpretation of, sub of subsection C, that Congress intended when it enacted subsection C that the government prove the act of expatriation, but that the citizen claimant have the burden of proof of showing that he performed the act under duress. Although there's that, nothing at all explicit, is there, dealing with burden of proof that's in the right. statute? Th that's right. I think since the statute is, is neutral on its face, uh, it's appropriate to go back to the legislative history to see what Congress had in mind. And that is what I've been trying to present to the court. Well, where, where Congress says nothing, thinking uh, off the top of my head. Why are we at all governed in respect of matters of burden of proof? Because it By is anything that's in the, in the legislative history? Ultimately, it's a question of interpreting the statute, and Congress can do it explicitly or it can do it implicitly. For instance, in this case, Congress deliberately did not put the word voluntarily into Section 401C, which was suggested to it. It did not put it in there. How are you saying you uh, have the burden of of sustaining the constitutionality of a statute which shuts off all explanations. That's right. The, That's what the, the government by saying that, yes, we may prove coerced entry into an army to have a different kind of a statute than if Congress is said and you have to defend, we don't care why he's in the army, coerced or not. That's right, Mr. Justice. The 1952 Act does have a provision just to the kind you said, and that is not, of course, yet before the court. That's not here. That's not before the court. Uh, then, with relation to conscription, uh, it seems relatively clear from the hearings of, of the committee and from some of the statements on the floor of the House that Congress knew uh, that men would be conscripted into foreign armies and that they did not think that fact alone would be enough of an excuse. Uh, again, there was quite a discussion between the various uh, people at the committee uh, and the representatives of the Labor Department, who were the foremost ones, and saying, give the man a chance to prove that he, that he did what he could, were also the ones who said, of course, if he puts his head into the lion's mouth, then he should be expatriated. If he has gone there knowing this will happen to him, that is, he will be drafted, then he should be expatriated. Uh, uh, assume that war breaks out and he is drafted. I would certainly let him make a showing that that was against, against his will and that he intended to keep his American citizenship alive. Uh, are these all individual legislators? No, they these are individual uh, members, uh, representatives of, of the state uh, uh, of the and the labor department. Yes. That's right. When it got into the Congress, there is there any, any uh, either adoption of what this committee of the cabinet said, or was there any independent effort by someone in charge of the bill in either house who spoke on this subject? Uh, two, both, both things occurred. One, both the sponsor, the sponsor in both houses, uh, Representative Schwellenbach, Congressman Reese, and Congressman Dickstein, referred uh, consistently to this uh, committee at which the representatives of the various departments had uh, appeared. Dickstein and was chairman, wasn't he? Dickstein was chairman of the committee, and Congressman Reese of Kansas was the ranking member who had a great do deal to do in the drafting of legislation. So they referred constantly. Uh, and you mean they adopted, they, they adopted? I can't say that they said we adopt everything no, no, no. that's said, but they, in essence, adopted the general view of these things that I've been saying to you. Uh, and also there is one slight reference on the floor of the House, two slight references, which are significant. And that is, in colloquies, Congressman Reese, who was one of the leading sponsors of the bill, referred twice 
to men called back to serve in the uh, army of the other country. Now, the only time you're called back is when, you, when you're conscripted or drafted. And so that is an indication on the uh, floor of the House. And Mr. Justice Harlan, we do not have these citations in our brief, so if I may, I would like to give them to you. Uh, appear at 86 Congressional Record, 86 Congressional Record, 13248 and 13250. Let me ask you one question. Does your argument boil down to something like this? Congress has a right to say that the court shall presume or infer from the fact that the man has been conscripted and served in a foreign land that he went in voluntarily? No, my argument is that that fact alone shall not show that he went in involuntarily, no, but, uh, that he, can, he must then go further and show other things uh, which bear upon the issue of voluntariliness. Do you think that's such an interrogative that's hot to Well, we think that there is a very rational connection between uh, uh, for the rational reason for Congress to impose the burden of proof of such a personal thing as voluntariness and conduct upon the individual rather than upon the government. And so we think there is no violation of the Tote case, which dealt only with an irrational presumption, which had no relevance to, to who knows best what the situation is uh, or uh, rational inference from other facts. Mr. Chief Justice, if I might have the indulgence of the court to say one further thing, because it is not in our brief. Yes, you may. Uh, at the se one reason why Congress adopted the rule that we have uh, believe that they did uh, adopt is that at the very same time, and this is referred to in the uh, House debate, at the very same time they adopted an, a very easy, short form renaturalization proceeding for uh, people who had uh, expatriated themselves by serving in a foreign army. That's Section 317C of the 1940 Act, which is not in our brief. 317C. What do you say at the same time? In the same act. In the same act. In the same act. So that it's one piece of in, That's right. It's, and it, it was referred to constantly on the floor of the House when people said how harsh this is. You're saying that a man who goes abroad uh, and serves in the foreign army gets expatriated. The answer was, well, maybe so, but he can come back easily. Now, of course, he must meet the ordinary uh, provisions of, the, of exclusion of the immigration uh, law that provided that. He could come back without quota, you know, but he had to meet the ordinary provisions for good character and so forth of the immigration law. Uh, and I should say, I don't know the reason why it wasn't done, that but the petitioner in this case could have availed himself of that provision until it was repealed in December 1952. He, did, he didn't do it, and perhaps his counsel or some other person didn't know about it, but it was available to him until it was repealed by the new act of 1952. What is the history of the errata and Okamura cases that they were uh, the history is that uh, Judge McLaughlin in Hawaii made more extensive findings of, of uh, uh, subsidiary findings, uh, which the government believed proved duress. But Judge uh, McLaughlin then refused to find duress as an ultimate fact uh, and held the statute unconstitutional again. We did not seek to appeal the case for the reason that the subsidiary findings of duress, which Judge McLaughlin had made, were precisely the same kind of findings made by district judges on the West Coast generally and other district judges in Hawaii, which the government has, had accepted and which had not appealed to the Ninth Circuit. And, but there were further findings than there were in this case, uh, Mr. Duress. But further findings of subsidiary findings of duress as to what happened to them than there were in this case. Where? Yeah. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, in the Okamura and uh, Murata cases, uh, as I think perhaps the solicitor said, uh, Judge McLaughlin found that there was no duress and the statute was unconstitutional. The government did not appeal. They are, uh, both these petitioners, uh, those persons are now American citizens as this petitioner would like to be. And if this petitioner remains an American citizen, since 317C is now no longer the law, It'll be only by virtue of the of the uh, of the justice and generos or generosity by justice of this court. Now, I mean, I mean, if he loses this case, he's uh, he's lost his American citizenship and he's on his way back to Japan. That's, all, that's what I'm trying to say, Your Honor. Now then, to to answer some some questions asked by justices of the court in, in colloquy, 
First, with respect to the problem of uh, believing the, uh, the petitioner. It is true that the district judge said he didn't believe the petitioner. Indeed, that's what the district judge said also in the Gonzalez case. Uh, but it's impossible to tell from what the district judge said what he believed and what he didn't. And what the solicitor has done is picked out the things that he doesn't like and say that the district judge didn't believe them. And of course, as already stated, if the district judge believed the petitioner completely, and it's conceded the petitioner is a citizen of the United States, and if everything else is rejected from the case, the petitioner remains a citizen of the United States, and the judgment should have been for him. Well, the trial judge may believe things said adversely. Said adverse to a witness, and just believe everything else. Yes, he could, but I'm and saying the record isn't clear. Fair. In fact, that's the common thing about liars. Now, a question was asked by Mr. Justice Warren as to what the State Department's position would have been. On page 28 of our brief is a reference to, the, to a statement appearing in a State Department publication, page 28, in which the State Department said, it is not the practice of the State Department to make representations with respect to dual citizens with respect to their obligations to other countries. The solicitor has said that a number of persons have ret returned from, uh, from Japan after they, re presumably after they received word uh, uh, of conscription. I know of none. I do know that the law of Japan, which is set forth in the transcript at page 23, Article 74, and is in, the, in this record, specifically provides that any evasion of military service by deserting or hiding and so forth will be punished to penal servitude of three years or less. This is aside of any, of any non-penal sanctions which might come from the Kempe Tai. Are you going to rest on this? Excuse me. Oh, page 28. Oh, excuse me. Uh, page 23 of the record. Are you going to rest on Mr. Horsey's argument on constitutionality because this statute's got a feature that his didn't have, namely dual nationality? Yeah. I'm going to rest on his argument to this extent, that uh, in his brief, uh, he makes the distinction between a person being a dual national through fiat of a foreign government or conduct by his father when he is an infant and voluntary action in acquiring dual nationality. In other words, we would concede that if this petitioner did some voluntary act acquiring dual nationality, he would be in a very different position uh, from, from what he is now. But we say there, there, there's no such thing in this record. Now, with respect to the matter of judicial notice and the matter of conditions in Japan, I appreciate the compliment the solicitor paid me as being one qualified to try these cases. I did not try this case. One of my younger colleagues did. He was just out of the law school, and he neglected to offer some things that were offered in other cases. Did he go but, to the University of California? Uh, I am not here to cast stones on that institution. That in any was, event, that was the intent of my question. in any event, Your Honor, we have in an appendix to our brief, which is the blue brief, given to the court extracts from official government documents with respect to conditions in Japan and the role of the Kempei Tai. We think they are the subject of judicial notice and they are to the effect that one who didn't comply with the conscription law of Japan not only ran the risk of going to jail, but took his life in his own hands so far as the conduct of the Japanese military police are concerned. And now one, one, one final word. In Mandoli versus Atchison, this court had before it an American who served in the Italian army and who took an oath of allegiance while he was in the Italian army. In that case, the Attorney General and Solicitor General confessed error with respect to that portion of the case because the Attorney General had ruled that with respect to the taking of an oath in the, in the Italian army, I'm referring to a matter which appears on page 24 of our blue brief, the Attorney General had ruled the choice of taking the oath or violating the law for a soldier in the army of fascist Italy was no choice at all. And our position is that under all the evidence in this case, 
the choice of an American citizen who happened to be a dual citizen by virtue of the act of his father when he was an infant. In Japan, when he received a one-way ticket, an order of conscription, the choice of his not complying with the order was no choice at all. He was under duress, and we think the evidence in this case discloses duress, and that the petitioner is entitled to his citizenship. That raises a question, Mr. Warren, for which there isn't time for argument, whether the Congress could uh, compel a dual citizen, citizen to make a choice between American citizenship and the other nation. That is not in this case. No, but it's there down the thing in the last book. 